אנא המתינו. הנה. אלון, תסביר. ובכן. לפניכם, לפניכם גרף שמציג את התוצאות של התשובות שעניתם, על פי מדדים של צבעים. אדום מייצג בסיכון, תשובות שדורשות פעולה. כתום זה שדורשה התערבות, שזה לא, לא משהו אבל יכול להשתפר. וירוק זה נורמטיבי, סגול זה מיטבי, ולבן זה שלא ענו בכלל השאלות. Uh, כפי שניתן לראות, לקהל שלנו אין הרבה פנאי, uh, הוא לא ישן הרבה פעמים כמו שצריך, זה יותר מחצי, יותר מחצי הקהל לא, לא אוכל כמו שצריך, לצערנו, מבחינת פעילות גופנית גם כן דרוש שיפור, uh, התנדבות זה בין לבין, למרות שגם uh, חינוך זוהי שליחות, מבחינה חברתית המצב נראה מאוד מאוד יפה, גם מבחינה כלכלית, המשפחה היא מרכיב מאוד מאוד חשוב אצל כל הקהל שלנו, ומצב רגשי, חבל על הזמן, מחוברים עוד לרגשות, המצב נראה די טוב בהיבט הזה. מחיאות כפיים לאלון. <אז> פרמטר אחד נטפל בו היום, אוכל. אוקיי, אז עכשיו אני רוצה להזמין את הסטייג' פרופסור אנדרס שלייכר. Division Head and Coordinator of the OECD Program for International Student Assessment and the OECD Indicator of Education System Program. האורח הבא שלנו עכשיו בעברית, שר החינוך של העולם, ואכן הוא אחראי לגיבוש תפיסות החינוך, למדדים וליעדים בעשרות מדינות. הוא הסכים להגיע לכאן, לכנס של אורט, כדי לספר לנו איך בונים את העתיד של הילד, אנדריאס שלייכר. Shalom, and I know that everybody in this room knows how we can educate children for our past. No? And people like you for doing that. Parents like their children to be educated, how they learned, and sometimes they get very nervous when their children learn differently and different things. Teachers sometimes prefer to teach how they were taught rather than how they were taught to teach. There are lots of kind of protectors of the status quo in our education systems. But the world is moving fast, and this is why sort of innovators and game changers in the education system, like the art schools, are so critically important. And there are more and more of them coming up, and our world actually needs these kinds of changes. If you think about the impact of technology, technology is connecting people, cities, continents, It empowers us in ways that we could never imagine before. No? But it's also made the world more volatile, more complex, more ambiguous. Think about the world of information about us. <laughs> Technology is incredibly democratizing. Everybody can participate. Everybody can engage in ways we could never before. But it's also concentrating powers in ways that we have never seen before. Google makes a million dollars for every employee, 10 times more than the average company in the United States. This is scale without mass, leaving people totally out of the equation. Technology is incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard anywhere. But it's also squashing individuality, squashing cultural uniqueness. It's incredibly empowering. If you think about, you know, the biggest companies in the last 10 years have been created by a big idea. People had the idea before they had the product. You no longer need a big factory, a lot of money to do something great. And actually, Israel is the best example for this. For those who have the right skills, it's incredibly empowering. But also often we trade our freedom for, you know, convenience, we follow the advice and dictates of technology, so it's disempowering as well. And where you end up on this kind of chart has a lot to do with how we develop our education systems. If you think about the world of information these days, fake news world, the post-truth world, literacy in the past was about you knowing something, extracting information, learning from what has been written. Literacy in the 21st century is about 
constructing knowledge. In the past, you know, if your students didn't know the answer, you could show them to an encyclopedia, ask them to look the answer up and believe the answer to be true. That is great. Today, you look up something on Google or Weibo or wherever, and you find 50,000 answers to your question. And it's no longer about knowing something, but it's about having a kind of compass in the navigation tools that help you find your way in this world. No? I think about the social media world. No? The world is more and more diverse, but technology is sorting us into these echo chambers and bubbles that make us think about people's people who are think like us, work with people who like us. No? Again, the kind of knowledge, skills, and character qualities that we need to create the kind of bridging social capital that moves us together. That's the challenge of tomorrow. This is just an illustration. In fact, we just heard that. We ask 15-year-olds in our PISA test, to what extent you know, do you really depend on technology? And you can see in Israel, half of the boys and girls at age 15 say, I feel really bad if I'm not connected. No? Being connected has become like drinking water or breathing air. And in some countries, it's 8 out of 10 students. No? You can see the use of technology outside school in most countries. Yellow Dot is about 2012, Blue Bar is 2015. In some countries, in just three years, that share of the time has doubled. No? It's a lot of time that young people spend connected to the world. No? It requires a different education. If you think about the world of work, We've seen a decline in the demand for manual skills. Now robots are taking over a whole factory. Everybody knows it. But in fact, the steepest decline has happened in what we call routine cognitive skills. Now, the kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, have also become easy to digitize, to automate, to outsource. Now, that's the dilemma for education today. The things that we know how to do best are disappearing quickest. Now, the issue is no longer that school is not effective or efficient. No. It's said it's risk to become irrelevant. In fact, when you see the rise in the demand for skills has been in what we call non-routine analytic skills, this is not about reproducing what you know, but extrapolating from what you know. Use your knowledge creatively in unfamiliar situations. No. But I also want to point you to the green line here. This is about social skills capacity to collaborate, compete, connect, work with people who are different from you, work with people who think differently from you. This is where the modern world puts the premium. And of course, we write those things nicely in our curricula. Now, that's not the question. But then, you know, in school, we put people behind individual desks. And at the end of the year, you know, we test them individually. You just have to be better than your neighbor. Now, that's the kind of game sort of walking against the need for social skills that we see in our economies, our societies. Well, you know, in PISA, we track the progress of education systems. And we focused our last assessment on science. It's very close to your agenda. And this was not the first time. The first time we did this was in 2006. It's very hard to think back as far as 2006 these days. No? But one day, you can remember is it was a year before the iPhone was invented. No? We didn't have smartphones in those days. No? Twitter was still a sound. You know, the Amazon was still a river. Lots of things that we take for granted today did not exist. But now look at educational progress. No? Students, of course, learn more things. But that's not what we are interested in our assessment. We don't test content knowledge of people. We wanted to look at, can they think like a scientist? And the design experiment. And you can actually see there's nothing that has changed in our education systems. And the world didn't stop in 2009. No? Basically, you can see how maps became dynamic, cars became electric, now they drive without a driver. Huge changes in technology and innovation. And we could actually, again, not see any changes in our education system, in the industrialized world. And just think about the last three years, you know, robots taking over whole factory, augmented reality, biogenetics, cloud computing, God knows what. You know, huge changes in the world around us. And again, students learn more things. I will not question that. But their capacity to think like a scientist is actually going backwards. 
There are some countries that are an exception to this. You can see sort of in Europe, for example, Portugal is a good example. Now they're sort of making their way forward. A very interesting sort of small country in Europe, really progressing fast. And you have countries like Singapore that move from good to great. No? But you can count them on a hand. Few countries with real progress. Israel is also among them. You can see sort of slight progress. But again, you know, the world is changing so much faster than our education systems. In fact, the gap between what our societies are looking for and what our education systems provide is becoming wider every day. You can see this in the toxic mix. We have, you know, university graduates looking for a job and at the same time, employers saying, you know, we cannot find the people with the skills that we need. But that gap is the biggest challenge of our times, and it's not just an economic, you find it in every sphere of social. And now I know you know what you say, think is the answer. We don't do so well in science, let's teach more science. No? And in fact, this is true in a country, no? If in Israel you add one hour of science teaching, you get better science outcomes. If in the United States you add one hour of science teaching, you get better science outcomes. Now, this is something true. Within a country, adding more volume gets you better outcomes. But now look how this looks across countries. On the vertical axis, you see the learning outcomes. On the horizontal axis, the total volume of learning time. And it looks like this. The more time children spend in school, the worse they come out on the PISA test. And now you ask, you know, how can you reconcile this? Within a country, time seems to be making things better, and across countries, time seems to be making things worse. Well, actually, the answer is not that difficult to find. The answer is that learning outcomes are always a product of the time that we spend and what we actually do. And you can see that on the next slide. It's a very nice illustration. Here you have the learning time. In blue is what you spent in school. In yellow is the time that you spent learning out of school, you know, tutoring, homework, all sorts of things. No? And you can see that varies enormously across countries. No? The winner is the United Arab Emirates. No? 60 hours per week students spent learning. No? You look on the left side in Finland, it's only about 35 hours. No? But when you now look at what students learn per hour, it looks like this. You can see that in Finland, students spend little time and learn a lot. And in the United Arab Emirates, students spend a lot of time and learn very little. It's not the volume of time that we spend. It's what we actually do with children. Very, very important that actually there's no relationship between. And you could make the same chart about money, lots of other things. Golden and Katz have written a nice book about the race between technology and education. Before the industrial age, neither technology and edu or education made a big difference for the lives of many people. But then came the industrial revolution, moving technology ahead of people. And today, you know, of course, we live on the industrial revolution. It's changed our lives. But you wouldn't have wanted to live in those times. Most people were left very badly behind. But then, you know, we invented public schooling, putting people in line with the norms of the industrial age, and it moved people ahead of technology, and that's basically created generations of prosperity. But since then, the model hasn't really changed, and now we face the digital revolution, they do it, which does exactly the same thing again, you know, moving technology ahead of the capacities of people. And if you make your children almost as smart as a smartphone that will not succeed in tomorrow's world. We're going to see again the level of social pain and the question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, what is it going to take to again move humans ahead of the world around us? Technology. Well, at the OECD we are also creating, trying to create a DNA of education. And it looks like this. It's basically three elements. It starts, you know, knowledge is always important. Content knowledge, diminishing in value, no, changing rapidly. What's more important, the capacity of thinking epistemically. No, thinking like a philosopher, thinking like an historian, not learning lots of names and places. No, thinking like a mathematician, not learning lots of formulas and equations. No, that kind of knowledge, understanding the foundations of the disciplines. 
the most successful education system, the, the systems these days are those who teach fewer things at greater depth, who get people to understand the foundations of different disciplines. But it doesn't stop this knowledge. No. The second part has to do with skills. No. In a world where Google knows everything, the world no longer rewards us just for what we know, but for what we can do with what we know. That's the skills component. And these are not just cognitive skills. In fact, as you've seen on the first slide, social and emotional skills are gaining very rapidly in, vo in value. No? The importance for us to actually to work and live together. Practical skills as well. And again, you know, when you think of the DNA, you think of a double helix. No? But there's a third very important part, and that's perhaps the most important part in this complex and rapidly changing world. No? Helping people to find their own place in this rapidly changing world and adjust the place as the world changes. No? Making ethical decisions, knowing you know, what's right and wrong, what's good and bad. Those kinds of capacities, and I know many educators say, this is not our job, this is a job of families. But no, schooling has a very, very central role in this to play in good schools. Good teachers actually do that today. The reason why, you know, when we do surveys, why teachers often, you know, reject it as well is because they're afraid. They say, well, in the past you judged us for what we taught. Now you judge us for who we are. Right? This is a much more challenging dimension, but very important. And this intertwining is really about what competency really means. Your capacity to mobilize your cognitive, social and emotional resources to do something. Now, in the center really is what we call agency. It's a capacity to mobilize, to do something. And today we need to think about co-agency as well. It's about co-creation of knowledge. It's all about learning is always a social process. Now, this is the most central element of the world of education of tomorrow. And you can sort of look at three classes of competencies that we put really at the forefront. The first it's the most obvious one. In a world of artificial intelligence, where anything that you can somehow structure is going to be digitized, the capacity of humans to create new value, to do things that are of intrinsic positive worth, is one of those key competencies. Our capacity to manage tensions and dilemmas. No? When things are no longer clear cut, when there are conflicting worldviews, no? Managing this, no? not teaching people the right answer, but teaching people ask the right questions. And the last part is really mobilizing this, taking responsibility, taking actions. No? It's actually something that, again, in good schools we see every day happening, but it's not happening in the average school. And you ask yourself, you know, how do you actually learn those things in school? Uh, first, I show you this in a little bit abstract form and then give you some examples. You learn this thing, first of all, by being able to anticipate. It's one of the most fundamental things that we need to develop, is our capacity to actually have an open mind, to have the eyes and ears to see how the world is changing. People who can think across the boundaries of subject matter disciplines are great in this. They just don't look at a problem through one disciplinary lens, but they're able to connect the knots where the next idea, next innovation is going to come from. This open-mindedness, very, very important. The capacity to anticipate, to be open, ready for when things can. Nobody can predict the future, not even a day, not even a second. It's about anticipation. It's about reflection, also very important. Can we take a critical stance? Can we question the established wisdom of our times? Do we help students develop their capacity? And then again, you know, taking responsibility, taking action. That is a kind of circle that is critically important to build those kinds of key competencies. And you ask yourself, you know, how is that reflected in our existing school cultures? No? One of the things that I did here is I mapped the existing school cultures against those ideas of the 21st century. No? And you can see we do quite well on communication, on problem solving, on critical thinking. No? For example, communication is something we learn in the arts, in the humanities, in mathematics, in language, in health, and so on. Lots of things happening. 
but you go to the right side, no? self-regulation, no? finding my own way, understanding who I am. That's very, very rare. A little bit happening in health education, a little bit in language, a little bit in mathematics, but not really. No? You look at student agency, no? the center of good education today, co-agency, the capacity of people to live and work with others, no? conflict resolution. Anticipation, you know, the start of building competence. You, know, you do not build competence without being ready for the new in the 21st century. It just does not happen in our existing school systems or entrepreneurship. You know, you're a great country. This is the country of entrepreneurship. But you look at the school system, we do not give people this idea that you know, they should take risks, they should try out things, they are encouraged to do this. So there is a big mismatch between what well, we need to be successful in how our existing school systems work. Now. And, you know, of course, curricular changes. We're very ready always to put something new on top. No? But that's actually been the biggest kind of threat to good education. What has happened in m many countries is that school systems have become a kind of mile wide but an inch deep. We teach lots of things at really very shallow levels of depth. This is the kind of disease of schooling of our times. I give you an example. I actually, I told this last night to Eli uh, Eisenberg. Um, you know, in the middle of the financial crisis, 2008, ev everybody said, oh, we need to teach our students, you know, financial education. It's very, very important that they're prepared for this complex financial world. And then, you know, in 2012, we thought, oh, well, why don't we look at actually how well this is happening? So we embedded financial literacy in the PISA test. And then, of course, we expected those countries that teach a lot of financial education to come out really well, and those who don't teach it to come out really badly. No? Actually, we didn't find any relationship between the teaching of financial education and the capacity of students to deal with financial problems. You know who came out on top of this test? students in Shanghai. They had never heard about financial education. No? But they could think like a mathematician. They knew what risk is, what probability is. They knew those fundamental concepts of mass and science. And they were able to extrapolate, apply them creatively to those new problems. And you know what happened to the children who were taught lots of financial education? As soon as we gave them a problem that was slightly different than the one they'd seen in school, they didn't know what this was about. It's about teaching fewer things at greater depth. There's a long way to get from here to the map that you've seen before. And it has to do, first of all, for moving from sorting people, that's the great strength of education systems, to really finding out how people learn differently. No? That's what we can learn from a country like Finland. No? The strong capacity of teachers actually to find out how do people learn differently, the diagnostic capacity of teachers personalizing learning, no? engaging this diversity in a positive way, no? instead of you know, tracking, streaming, sorting people. No? Moving from routine cognitive skills, the kind of things that are disappearing, to complex ways of thinking, complex ways of working. And of course, that requires a very different caliber of teachers. No? Moving away from you know, the standardized, compliance-based education systems to actually people who develop wisdom on the front line. Today, even the best education minister can no longer solve the problems or do justice to you know, hundreds of thousands of students and ten thousands of teachers and schools. But if we can actually mobilize the knowledge and experience of people at the front line, no? teachers, school leaders, who are already out there, who have great ideas, if we can capture that knowledge, we can build the best education system. It's easy to get knowledge into the system. It's really hard to get the good practice and experience out of the classroom into the system. But that's how today's most successful systems evolve. And that has to do with the work organization. No? We have this very kind of tailoristic approach to teaching and learning. No? You know, you're the teacher, you're the school psychologist, you're the uh, social worker, and so on. We basically have taken, actually, we have made education less holistic. And it gets again, you can learn that from the most advanced education system. If you are a teacher in Japan, you know, you teach your students, 
but you also cook the meal with them, you know, you do the sports lesson with them, you uh, basically clean the classroom with your students. It's everybody's business, and as a teacher and students, you're all part of this. No? This is sort of taking responsible for student learning. And you teach about half of the hours that you teach in Israel. It's about 14 hours that a Japanese t teacher spends teaching. But they work more than teachers in Israel, if you sum it all up. What do they do in the rest of the time? They spend the time with students understanding who their students are, understanding how their students learn, working with their parents. No? That is basically how the teacher takes on additional functions. No? Let me talk about these transitions in a little bit more detail. Moving you know, from sorting people to actually making sure that all students succeed. I want to show you one chart which I think, you know, shows us that poverty need not be destiny. I start with the Dominican Republic on the left side, you know. I order learning outcomes by decile of social background. No? The red square are the most disadvantaged students. The green triangle are the wealthiest students. You can see there's a huge achievement gap. No? Social background is a huge influence shaping learning outcomes. And some people say, well, you see, there's nothing you can do about it. But now I can look at similar children and see how they do in different countries. And it looks like this. You can see that children from the same social kind of context do so differently across countries. Now you can look at the 10% most disadvantaged children in Vietnam or in Estonia, and they do as well as the average child in Israel or the OECD, and they do better than the 10% wealthiest children in much of South America. 